Gabriel Carter. Welcome to Dog's Breakfast. Our guest today is Stan Hyde. We are blessed by serendipity that Stan lives in our fair city of Vancouver and is one of the top Godzilla experts in the world. <laughs> Welcome to Sigh. Dog's Breakfast. <laughs> what a thing to be known for. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. All right, so launch it right in. Here we go. Question number one. Okay. Okay, so over the years, uh, the manifestation of Godzilla has ranged from the restless souls of the dead to tense ally of mankind. Is there a particular Godzilla that rings more true to you? Well, okay, the, the very first Godzilla, Ishiro Honda, who was the director, mm -hmm. said Godzilla is nothing more nor less than a walking nuclear firestorm. Mm -hmm. So that first Japanese film is, is the one that really has teeth. It's about, it's about uh, it was brought about because of American nuclear testing and there was this incident called the Lucky Dragon Number no. Five, where a, a, a bunch of sailors were out fishing, and uh, the the United States didn't say what they were going to do. They just said, "There's this no sail area. Don't go into it." So they thought, "Oh, that's nobody's going to be fishing up there, so we'll go up there and we'll fish." And what was going on up there was a testing of an H bomb for the oh, first time. Wow. So the the fishermen on that boat were irradiated. Most of them died afterwards, and it was a huge international incident, except in North America, because there the United States sort of kept it, you know, kind of quiet. Right. So, uh, so that incident, among you know, as well as the testing that was going on, was sort of the inspiration for doing that original Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Honda, who was the director, even said, "Well, we were so naive; we thought we could make this movie about a monster, and we might stop nuclear testing. Like people might understand how how <laughs> devastating to nature, you know, which was pretty naive." But, uh, but, yeah, and the movie did get accused later on of exploiting it, just like a modern mm -hmm. movie would probably do, too. But uh, the bottom line is that's the one that's the legendary one. That's the one that, you know, is, is actually, sorry, not that legendary one, but, but uh, <laughs> the, the one that actually kind of established Godzilla as, as an important character. And then, of course, what happens is, what do you do next to follow that up? So, yeah. so that's my favorite one. Uh, there's another one in 2011 that was made by uh, a director named Shusuke Kaneko, who also directed Death Note, and he also directed three Gamera movies. Gamera's a giant flying turtle. We don't have to go into that. Oh, yeah, Gamera's, and this is his Gamera, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Mr. Kaneko's Gamera. Yeah. So anyways, um, <laughs> that one's pretty subversive, too, uh -huh. because in that one, Godzilla is actually, uh, he has all white eyes um, to portray the fact that he's the ghost of the Pacific War dead. And, and one of the themes of it is that, that the Japanese and the rest of the world have forgotten World War II, which, if you think about it, is a pretty subversive idea, you know, mm -hmm. in Japan, that, you know, that the, the war has been forgotten, you know, right. and you have to take some responsibility for remembering your past. And throughout it, people talk about, well, you know, somebody says at one point, didn't Godzilla attack New York? And, and another guy says, well, people in the States think so, but not here, referring to that Matthew Broderick movie, right? And, and <laughs> later on, a monster called Baragon appears, and a young guy says, red Godzilla is at Gotemba, and his dad goes, Godzilla's not red. So there's this division between people who actually remember things that happened in the past. And oh, people. wow. Yeah, so that's, that's probably my, those are the two really serious ones. But then there's all kinds of funny ones, and Godzilla's almost sure. like a superhero and stuff like that. And, you know, part of the problem with being a fan is I like them all. <laughs> on, on a really, really bad day, I can even find reasons for liking the Matthew Broderick one, but I won't say that out loud. I guess I did. I think you just did. I just did. <laughs>
maybe too big. And, and here's the technical problem. Yeah. The technical problem is bu buildings keep getting bigger. Mm -hmm. So originally, uh, he was something like, and the, the, the other technical problem is you can't make the suit bigger because the suit is a guy. So the suit always remains the same size. You can make it a little bit bigger. For um, GMK, they put pads on the, the soles of the feet, and your head is actually in the neck of the suit, so okay. the head is up top. So you can extend it a little bit that way, but, but essentially you're stuck with a guy who's five feet, six feet. I think the GMK suit is seven feet tall. That's the size of the suit, okay. so long as you're dealing with the suit. So in the, the 80s, in 84, they made Godzilla bigger because Tokyo was bigger, and it was um, felt that, well, if you know Godzilla will look too small if we keep him to the size he was originally, which so was about... I guess. Yeah, you know, so, so we'll, which was about 300 feet, I believe, for the original Godzilla's winners, make him bigger. And the problem with that is when you make him bigger, then you're still working on a model set. Mm -hmm. So you can't put the same detail in the models that you could before because the models are technically smaller, the buildings are, you know, aren't at the same scale. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting things happened, we sort of talked about Gamera before, in the 90s, um, Kaneko and all show, uh, special effects man who's great, who became a director, right now he's, yeah, I just found out, he's directing Attack on Titan, the anime, if you're familiar with that, it's cannibal giants. We all live in walled cities and have to fight cannibal giants that are walking all over the place. Anyways, oh, wow. he's directing that right now. Well, Higuchi basically went, you know, when he was director of special effects, we, we're gonna make Gamera smaller. Because even though he's still a giant monster, but when we make him smaller, we can put more details in the miniatures. Right, right, right. And, and they'll look more real. So in uh, 1999, when Toho brought Godzilla back, because they brought Godzilla back again after the Matthew Broderick movie, because nobody was very happy with it, and they did five movies after that one. Yeah. They actually shrunk Godzilla back down a little bit, because they had the example of that Gamera movie, and they, it was like, okay, well, the miniatures look better if he's just a little bit smaller. Right. Right. Uh, now the problem is computer generated images with uh, the newest Godzilla he's entirely computer generated in the sense that you know now now the models are digital models so you can make them as big as you like and so he's gotten a lot bigger and yeah and uh, <laughs> sometimes maybe to the point of I'll be interested if, if he was in the movie more than he was mm -hmm. if it would start to stretch credibility if we kept seeing him, because one of the things they did that was quite clever, I think, in this movie, is they didn't overplay their hand in terms of showing us Godzilla. Yeah. And and yeah. that's, some people are criticizing the movie for that, but I think in Quite some ways... Too, yeah. I, I liked it. I, I liked the I movie. Liked too, yeah. I liked the movie. It's, it's hard to even talk about it, because my relationship with things Godzilla is so complicated. I mean, I don't know if I really like the movie yet. It'll be five years before I really know, <laughs> you know, where, where it stands with all the other Godzilla movies. But, Understood. But... But a number of people said he's too big. He's too big. You know, in the scene in the Bikini Atoll, it mm -hmm. looks like he's grounding out. You know, he's supposedly, I guess, coming up out of the water and, you know, breaching or something. But it's like, how does he even get his belly across the sand when he does that? You know, like he's actually, <laughs> he's, he's kind of too he's big. That, he's that gigantic. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but of course it always makes him more impressive the bigger he goes, so long as you forget about the square cube law and the fact that when something's really big, it just collapses under its own weight. But right. we don't have to get all scientific and stuff. <laughs> Uh, who has been Godzilla's most fierce adversary in your, uh... Oh, know? wow. There was been uh, a lot, but... Um... Just offhand. My favorite adversary probably is King Ghidorah, the mm -hmm. three-headed dragon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I hesitate because I was thinking before I came over... I was thinking about Mothra and how many films Mothra has been in. And technically, Mothra has been Godzilla's adversary in a lot of movies, but also been Godzilla's ally. And I guess it, we're... What I like about Mothra is, to me, one of the things I like about Japanese, because I'm a monster movie fan, like I love universal horror movies, and I love Hammer horror movies from England, and yeah. I love Italian, Mario Bava, and all those guys, you know, Dario Argento, I love all from around the world. <laughs> but the thing that makes Godzilla movies special is the fact that kaiju, you know, giant monsters from Japan, they don't really work like giant monsters from North America. So Mothra is a monster, but Mothra is also a good guy. and, and Probably Mothra is also a female, you know, or at least she's the one monster that is described quite often in Toho's literature as female. It's not always that clear. Sometimes, sometimes they they talk about her as her. I talk about her as her, mm -hmm. as if as if, it, if she's a male. But the bottom line is that 
that she is such a strange monster when you think about monsters because here's this monster who you know basically is looking after two 11 inch high girls who are her priestess is concerned about the ecology of the planet and frequently is sort of like the phoenix in harry potter like the adult form dies and the babies hatch and she's reborn and it's the ones that are reborn that it's, it's wacky you know it's not like a monster They're, you yeah, know she's beautiful right you know yeah. so in that way I think I guess I you know Mothra is my my pick for the my second favorite monster and mm -hmm. sometimes she's Godzilla's ally and, some, and sometimes she's his you know enemy King Ghidorah who's only been good once in GMK that movie by Kaneko mm -hmm. and not his intention to do that but he was forced by the studio it was one of those i want to use this monster they said nobody knows that monster we make more money from king Ghidorah, so you use king Ghidorah. <laughs> you know so once he's been good but he's been the the badass toho monster i guess so. yeah yeah i think he'd be one of my favorites too yeah. uh so are there any fantasy directors that you would want to direct a godzilla film <sighs> well the thing i would like to see the great the most which isn't going to happen but what I'd really like to... First, I, I, let me go back to Legendary. Mm -hmm. I actually spent two days as a, as a background walker on Godzilla because it was shot here in Vancouver. So I got to watch Gareth Edwards direct. I didn't know that. And, mm -hmm. and he is... He was great, you know? Like, he seemed... You know, what, what do I know from watching two days? But I've been on some other movie sets in my time and he seemed really prepared and really focused and mm -hmm. it was really something he was wanting to do <coughs> and stuff like that. So he's great. Um, we were lucky to get him. Well, I would love to see a Japanese director making the movie for an American company. And mm -hmm. the two guys I think I, I'd like to see most are Shusuke Kaneko uh, or Shinji Higuchi. You know, it would be amazing to get uh, to, to do that film because I think both of them have been really visionary in terms of, you know, Higuchi as a special effects guy who graduated and become a director and Kaneko is a guy who really understands story, I think. You know. Do you see uh, that kind of cross-pollination? I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. But it has happened in the past. You know, it's things like with The Grudge, you know, where Sam Raimi went out and mm -hmm. got the Japanese director to do the thing. So it's a possibility. And I, 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 that it kind of, it, it even, the inception of this legendary movie, if, if you w watch the credits, you don't have to watch the credits. I'm a film teacher. I <laughs> um, one of the guys who is a producer on this movie is a guy named Mr. Bana, mm -hmm. uh, who is actually the director of Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. the way yeah. this legendary movie came about was he actually wanted to do a 3D IMAX movie that was sort of almost a sequel to Smog Monster. And he took it to North America. He got the blessings of the studio and he got, you know, and, and he took it to North America and shopped it around as, you know, let's do a 45 minute IMAX film featuring Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And, and what happened was that was just at the point where the kind of movie technology, you know, movie theaters were going into this kind of digital projection and, oh, look, we can do 3D. And it won't be the old 3D that tore your eyes out and stuck them in backwards because it's, it's not a film projection, it's a video. So they, they went, oh, well, we could do this, but we, why do IMAX? Why not do an actual you know, feature? Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, this movie was brought to Legendary by Toho or by somebody who had worked for Toho and it was rep you know, so we kind of need to see them go back the other way and go, well, what about picking one of these young guys from Japan and let them, you know, mm -hmm. do it because I, I think they've got some really, really great ideas, but, you know, it would be lovely. Uh, American directors? I think we lucked out with Gareth Edwards. I think he was a really good guy to get. I think his heart's in did I Did I hear correctly that he's been signed on to do two more? After, cause this one's I, I understand that he's going to do that, but he's also doing a Star Wars movie now. Uh -huh. He's doing e either Yoda or Boba Fett, apparently. He's doing one of the side screen movies for mm -hmm. Star Wars. So, so yeah, so it uh, the idea is apparently, yeah, that he'd do a trilogy probably was what I heard. Cool. So this, so this last question, it's just sort of, it's, it's kind of an addendum because you've really kind of gone into this. Okay. Uh, it's certainly about your, your personal passion, but uh, do you have any theories why Godzilla has been such a long-standing cultural phenomenon? Phenomena? Yeah. Well, and, and also just about your own passion personally. Sure. Well, you know, he is Godzilla, King of the Monsters. I think one of the things is he's big, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, especially when you're young. I mean, I saw my first Godzilla movie when I was like seven years old or something like that right and you know he's a really big monster it's like the real king kong is only like well he's 24 
feet high in the jungle and then he's like 50 feet high in New York. But Godzilla, even at that time, was 300 feet tall, you know? So he's, he's always kind of the big monster. You know, you go much bigger than that. You get like Galactus in Marvel Comics. It's not, it's not a character that can interact with things anymore, right? right? right, right, right. You know, so, so Godzilla is, I think, a number of things. One, he's a, a dinosaur, and, and that's a thing that a lot of people love. And he's a metaphorical dinosaur. He's a dinosaur that's been turned almost into a dragon by nuclear radiation. So there's that sort of, uh, you know, the dinosaurs are extinct. If we keep doing this, maybe we'll become extinct too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that kind of inherent warning in, in just the way he's, he's... Plus, he's a really cool design, you know, in the sense that he's this upright theropod. He's kind of old-fashioned in that sense, but but he's got these, you know, plates on his back. And, and if you think about it, you know, here's this creature that breathes fire, and he's got these things on his back that are almost like radiators, you know, so they've got all these little spikes so the air can swirl around them. And they do glow when he breathes fire. So it was on the people's minds when they were doing this, you yeah, know, like this yeah. is a way to exchange heat and stuff like that. So he's kind of just a cool science fiction creature, again, if you ignore a few scientific laws that would really kind of nix him. <laughs> uh, but... But, you know, visually, it's really cool. And I guess the other thing, I'm, I'm going to Kaneko for this, is, and, and I think one of the reasons why people didn't like that Matthew Broderick movie is uh, Kaneko said when he was doing his Godzilla movie, Gamera is a masochist. Gamera goes and tries to help, gets beat up, has to go away and sleep it off, and then come back. He keeps coming back for more pain. Whereas right. Godzilla is a sadist. He keeps attacking and attacking and attacking. Mm-hmm. Cr- you know, and, and that was sort of part of the problem with the Matthew Broderick movie, is that you've got this dinosaur creature that's supposedly Godzilla, but it spends a lot of time running and hiding from the military. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and, and that's not really how the metaphor works. The metaphor is Godzilla, nothing stops him, even if it might be a better idea not for him to go on. And, no, you, know, sure. yeah, yeah. you know, so that's, that's I think, one of the, I, I think those are elements of why he's popular. For me, a lot, you know, it, it's like anything else. If you're a kid and you see something for the first time, it's like, wow, you know, that is so cool. And it's not the coolest movie in the sense that there's a lot of people who don't like King Kong versus Godzilla because, you know, the King Kong suit's a little funny looking. Uh, you know, ki- yeah, King Kong fans, you know, are not known for their love of the Toho Kong. <laughs> I might even, I might even throw up an image here, yeah, 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 just yeah. to remind people yeah. what that film but, looked like. You know, the thing about it is, a, it's a comedy. If you see the Japanese version, it's a deliberate comedy. It's yeah. meant to be a comedy. You got guys playing Hope and Crosby. You got guys playing Groucho Marx, pretty much. You know, and and it's funny. And and in Japan, they advertised it as. You know, they'd be calm in the paper. I'm glad to represent the United States here in my fight with Mr. Godzilla, you know. And it was, you know, there's a part where, you know, they basically, Kong's picked up a girl, and in order to get her back, they have to get him drunk. And they make him drunk and play music, and he sits down and he, he drunkenly collapses on the parliament, you know, Japanese parliament <laughs> building. There is some satire going on in this in this film, you know. Gotcha. Um, anyway, so that's the first one I saw, and so it's pretty hard you know, to get, wow, that was amazing out of your mind, even though, you know, in the, in the world of, one of the things that bugs me personally is a lot of people go, oh, well, the effects are so bad. And it's sort of like being a film teacher, people forget about history. You know, if you actually look at Toho's films in the 1960s and the nearest comparable thing, which would probably be a, a filmmaker like George Pell, the special effects are very similar, you know? Mm-hmm. So this idea that the effects are tacky is compared to... 2001 or Star Wars, you know, with a different technology from, you know, decades later, the effects are tacky, but that's not really the way they would have been perceived at the time those movies were out. They were actually pushing the boundaries of what special effects. I agree. That's a bit short-sighted. Yeah, it's one of those things. So anyways, that's how it got started. And then there's a a fellow named J.D. Lees in Steinbeck, Manitoba, who put an ad in Starlog magazine. He was going to publish back in the 90s a little Godzilla newsletter because he'd lived in Japan. He had information that was hard to come by here. And he got so many responses, it became a magazine. And the magazine is still going after 100 issues. And in 1995, they started a convention. Mm-hmm. And so I got a call from JD about, we, could you come out to the convention? And so I've been going out to the convention ever since. So for me, it's almost like having a family, a Godzilla family, because mm-hmm. there are people I see every year and people I'm in contact with all year long. And I've been to Japan now, and I know a lot of people... You know, some of the guys I mentioned, Higuchi, when we were in Japan in March, there was this new restaurant called the Kaiju Sakaba Monster Restaurant. And I got a, I, <laughs> I got a so Facebook cool. message from Sinji Higuchi. You know, I, 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 I said, I'm going to be in Japan. Is there any Kaiju stuff to do? He says, let me see if I can work out going to the Kaiju Sakaba. So it might be hard. I can't get a reservation. But he says, I'll use the force. So what the force turned out to be was Higuchi invited 
two Ultraman directors, and mostly Ultraman monsters in, in mm -hmm. the Kaiju Sekawa. So, yeah, exactly. So, two <laughs> Ultraman directors, a guy who had played Ultraman, a guy who built all kinds of models and stuff like that, who I know quite well, and Higuchi, and said, well, we would like to go. So, we arrived there, and of course, we got taken in. They took photographs. They wanted our autograph. I'm sitting there going, what the hell, you know? <laughs> Higuchi's going, just, just draw a monster. It's on your name, you know? <laughs> It'll be okay, you know? I'm feeling all this Canadian guilt, like we're being marched past all the people who are waiting to get in. Like, oh, I feel That's bad, funny. but it Canadian was, you know, funny. totally, you know, so my whole life changed because of seeing King Kong versus Godzilla. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a film teacher. I don't really come from film teacher stock. You know, my whole interest in movies and stuff kind of got started because of this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I started reading magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland, which were mm -hmm. all about how those movies were made. And because of that, I found out about movies. And because of that, like I say, because of this fandom, I mean, I know the guy who built the Titanic for James Cameron, the 124 scale, a guy named Gene Rizzardi, because he does all model. He did the models for that Matthew Broderick one, too. Mm -hmm. He once said to me, you know, when our Godzilla comes up out of the ground, I wish it was the Toho Godzilla, and he had our Godzilla, and we shaking him like a cat, <laughs> trying to break his neck. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, I, and, and, you know, and, and I got to know and talk to these people because we're all monster kids, basically, because we all like Godzilla. So, so. Monster kids. I yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So. That's awesome. Hey, Stan, thank you very much for coming by. Thanks for having me on. All right, cheers. Bye, folks. Bye now. Dog's Breakfast, Person of the Hour, is the incomparable Fred Rogers. I'm Gabriel Carter, this is Nido, and we'll see you around the bend. <laughs>